Okay, let's uh, go ahead. So, uh, in the last two weeks, we discussed uh, formal string vulnerability, uh, which is quite different from stack based buffer workflow, which we started in the first half of the semester. So, in stack based buffer workflow, we overwrite the buffer sequentially. Uh, however, in formal string vulnerability, with that percentage n modifier, we can overwrite anywhere in the victim's uh, address space, victim program process uh, addresses. So uh, today we were started talking about something more interesting, which is called the uh, return oriented programming or ROP. Uh, personally, I feel ROP is one of the greatest inventions in binary hacking in the last um, 15 years. And um, today we will first talk a little bit about the history, uh, the basic ideas of ROP. Uh, actually, so far, you already, uh, from what you learned, you already know the basic ideas. You just didn't put it together. Uh, we will say two ROP examples. Uh, those are quite complicated, so you need to stay with me today. Uh, then we will do some in-class exercise. So you are going to develop a ROP share code. Uh, next week, we will keep talking about ROP. We were talking about uh, some more complicated examples and how to debate Rob uh, in real world. So let's first try to understand why Rob is so important. Uh, depending on whether attackers need to inject binary code into the victim's address space, so far we have seen two types of uh, control flow hijacking attacks. Uh, the first type, usually we call it a code injection attack in which uh, the attacker first need to inject some malicious binary code into the victim process address space, then try to subvert the intended control flow of the legit program so the victim program can call the malicious share code. So we usually call the injected code a share code, but the share code do not always need to return you a share. So you have been developing some share code in this class. Uh, you read a file, uh, print out the content. It doesn't really return a shell, but uh, historically, we still call it a share code. So for stack-based buffer workflow, we also have uh, discussed many places we can inject that share code. We can inject the share code on that uh, vulnerable buffer. We can inject it uh, in command line arguments, also in uh, environment variables. So to defeat those kind of code injection attacks, the modern CPUs and operating systems, they have a feature called data execution prevention. So basically you will say this piece of memory, for example, the stack uh, is not executable. Even if you put code there, the CPU will stop uh, you from executing anything there. However, so we know cybersecurity is always an arms race. When the defenders solve the share code injection, attackers come up with a new ideas of code reuse attack. So in code reuse attack, the attacker doesn't have to inject any new code, like the share code, into the victim's address space. Uh, but instead, it tries to reuse what is already there in the address space. Uh, we have been looking at return to deep sale attack. So that is one example of code reuse attack. So in return to libc, we don't need to inject any code. Um, we only need to overwrite the return address on the stack and to hijack the control flow to a, a libc function. So usually what we do is uh, we, in, we override the return address. So when the vulnerable function returns, it returns to the system function. And we give it an uh, argument, something like a, uh, the name of the share, so we can create a share box. So, however, we only did return to deep say on 32 bit programs. We didn't do this on 64 bit program. And uh, in the first half of the class, I said um, it's not possible to do that in 64 bit with what we learned there. 
So today we are going to do the 64-bit hacking uh, with the help of uh, return oriented programming or ROC. So uh, a little bit of history of uh, ROC. So this technique has been there uh, since 2005. Uh, but um, 2005, someone published something, not a very serious or well written paper, uh, but it already has the, had the general idea of raw. And in 2007, in one of the top security conferences, CCS, uh, that is uh, when the very general idea of raw was proposed. Um, the paper was titled The Geometry of an innocent flesh on the bone. So it's called return into the state without function calls on X86. And the, it's a single author paper. The author, he was a professor. When he published this paper, he was a professor at um, uh, UCSD, I believe. So he was a single author of this paper. Uh, he realized he discovered something very interesting. So he decided to publish a paper just by himself. So um, right now he is at uh, University of Texas uh, at Austin. So he, he made a lot of uh, important contributions to software security, system security, and uh, crypto as well. Uh, this paper was published in CCS. Uh, he, in this paper, he discussed how to generalize return to deep state techniques uh, into something more powerful. Um, that's why he called it return oriented programming. Uh, he explained why this attack is possible in theory. He also find out that this attack is quite feasible uh, in reality. Uh, in his own words, this is something I took from the paper. He said, in any sufficiently large body of x86, executable code, there were exist sufficiently many useful code sequence. So that code, code sequence in the class will record code gadgets that attacker who controls the stack will be able to force the exploited program to undertake arbitrary computation. So basically, as long as the attacker can control the stack, you can prove the data on the stack, you do not inject code onto the stack then you can do arbitrary computation. You can do anything you want. You can take full control of that computer. So this paper actually was published in 2007. Then 10 years later, uh, it won test of time award in CCS 2017, 10 years later. So it's very difficult to get a award like this. Uh, it shows how important this work is in academia and also uh, in uh, real world. Uh, actually, uh, one of the, our professors, Professor Marilla Blanton, uh, she has a paper also won test of time paper award from uh, CCS. I don't remember which year, but uh, maybe 2019 or something. Very difficult to get. So uh, part of the homework this week is to read the original CCS paper. Uh, if you are really into this area, there's another paper I suggest you to read. Um, it's a journal version of this paper, which is much longer, published uh, five years later after the original paper. So this journal version is quite difficult to read. It's um, 40 pages or something, but it has all the details. Okay, so um, what is wrong? So recall that in return to deep state attacks, um, we can return to uh, any functions in the state library and we can chain them together as long as those functions do not take any arguments. So we can actually call arbitrary unlimited number of functions together with the return to uh, deep state uh, tactic. So in route, the only difference between return to libc and rob is that we are not going to return to the beginning of any function. We're not 
calling the functions. We are returning to um, a lot of the start of some code gadgets in the memory address space. And there are so many code gadgets. So later we will take a look uh, what are code gadgets, what are their properties. So in Rob, basically we chain those chunks of codes or gadgets together. Those gadgets are not functions. Uh, so they do not have function prolog or a dog there. Um, then we chain them together to accomplish some intended uh, objective. Usually in hacking, it will be something uh, malicious. We chain them together to build some kind of share code. Uh, the gadgets, they are not necessarily stored in continuous memory. So the gadgets are very small, usually five, four instructions. You will say later, some of the gadgets, just the one instruction, just a return. That is also useful. Some of the gadgets, maybe like four or five instructions, usually not very long. So the way we chain them together is very similar uh, to the way we chain the return to deep state functions together. Uh, so the attacker, in this case, they do need to come to the stack. But they do not need the stack to be accessible. We're not injecting code to the stack, but just overriding the stack. So um, you may think it's very hard to find those gadgets. So I'm going to show you uh, why finding gadgets are easy. So basically, gadgets are a code code pieces that ends with a return instruction. As long as it ends with a return instruction, it could be some useful gadgets. Okay, so you may think there probably are not so many gadgets out there. Obviously, every function that ends, there is a return instruction. But actually, at byte level, return instruction is just to have, have those kind of four values, uh, say three, say B, say A, say two. Okay, for x86, those four values are the return instruction. So as long as in the memory, there are values like that, that can be integrated as a return instruction. So you may have a five bytes instruction, and in that five bytes instruction, there is one byte is say three. Originally, that say three is not part of opcode. It's not the instruction opcode. It's not the operation, it's maybe just a data. For example, you're moving five, say three, you're moving say three to register AX. AX. So of course there is a value say three there. It was the data part, not the opcode part. But if you interpret it, the CPU interpreted this instruction from the middle in the middle, not at the beginning, then that state three could be interpreted as an instruction, not the data part of the operate uh, the of the instruction. So to show you, it's not that hard to find gadgets in memory. Uh, we're going to do a small uh, experiment. So what we're going to do is we will just generate some random data. And uh, I want to show that even random data can be integrated as legit instructions because the x86 instruction set is very dense. And the, you have been, you have seen that different instructions they have different lengths. Some instruction just one byte. Some instruction can have up to fifteen bytes. So we just generate some random data. We just do a cat from device random. Let's generate from here. Okay, just a little bit. That's probably too long. Let's see how many bytes we got there. So I just generate like two seconds and we got so much data there. We don't need that much. So we just do a grip. Maybe we go. Let's do 20 lines of this. The same code format. So those are some random bytes we generated, maybe 200 bytes. If 
if we put this into the online is uh, similar, just like this. And then let's say if the CPU can consider this as a valid instructions, this is this is garbage, random data we just generated. So you can see that CPU will actually, at least x86, will actually believe this is uh, very much legit instructions. It can be disassembled. Of course, if you execute those instructions, it's very likely even the first one, even the very first instruction, you may trigger a second fault because there is a memory access there. Uh, the second one may be the same thing. Um, let's say if we remove the first instruction, first byte, disassemble this again. Oh, this time it cannot generate any instruction. We give it one more. Okay. You can see. So the instruction set itself is very dense. Even if you give it garbage, very high chance it will be uh, interpreted as legit instructions. Even though when you execute them, uh, they may crash your code. And then let's say if we can find any return here. Um, can do a search. Oh, in this example, we don't have a phase three or something. Oh, there is a phase three, but that phase three was not interpreted as a return. So you don't see that. But if we delete all of this, if the CPU start executing from here, then obviously that will be a return, right? See that phase three? No, that's not. I think there are some format issues. Um, so it's not considered a phase three. Okay, I'm not sure what the format we are expecting here. But if it's a C3, it should be a symbol of the return instruction. Uh, later, we can see other examples. Okay, let's come in. So, uh, we're going to use some tools in this class to find those code gadgets which are uh, under with a return instruction. And one of the tools we're going to use is called the uh, log gadget. This is a uh, uh, open source tool. Uh, I don't I don't remember if I installed this on the VM I gave you. If I didn't, uh, you just uh, can install uh, following those um, uh, instructions. So in step two here, you are going to install a project called PipeSol. So a lot of open source disassemblers and also program analysis tools on battery uh, relies on this project called PipeSol. So if you do battery research, um, eventually you have to use this project. So this project is basically a disassembler. Uh, it, it can disassemble all kinds of architecture binaries, x 6 to R. Uh, the project itself was developed in C++, uh, but it has a very easy to use, user-friendly uh, Python interface as well. Uh, that's why the tool we're using actually is a uh, raw gadget was developed in Python, however, on the line uses C++ project. So to find the gadgets in a battery, uh, what we need to do is we just run this raw gadget, Python when you get the battery name. So for example, Code we are going to use is called a return to libc today. Return to libc, that should be our main function right now. So, this is a program we are going to hack today. A very simple program. 
Uh, we are using our main function, main function calls a vulnerable function. The vulnerable function has a buffer, four bytes in SQL, then it opens a file for the exploit, then simply copy that exploit to that buffer. So obviously, there is a buffer overflow. However, the stack is not executable. Uh, even though we can override the return address, uh, you cannot do, um, you cannot inject the share code there. Uh, also, we are going to hack the 64 bit version of this. That's why the return to the state technique, which is a board, doesn't work anymore. So, for this program, if we run that uh, rock tool, let's say what kind of gadgets it can find with. That's a, that's a tool, drop gadget. So we can, can do a help. It tells you what features it has. Then if we want to find the gadgets in this file, we can do a binary. Then we do this return to deep C. We're going to do the dynamic version 64. Okay. So you can see that in this, Binary, it finds us 67 gadgets. Okay? Not all the gadgets, not all the gadgets under with a return instruction, some of them under with a, a call instruction and a, or a jump instruction. So in this class, we're not going to talk about those gadgets. Uh, that belongs to another category of um, handling techniques for the uh, jump or we are programming. The idea is similar. One second. Yeah. So, I just got to ask, you just need to the jump over in the file. I had to do a jump that. I had to do a closing jump. With that, I need to jump to a speed in the public DLL. Does that make sense? That's the same thing. So, those are the gadgets. For a jump array program, but in this class, we'll only cover return array. The basic idea is very similar. Yeah. So, as you can see, we can have uh, 67 gadgets in this binary, not many. And you can see, um, basically, we only really care about the return ones. So, this one, nothing else, just a return. This one, you have several copy instructions before. Uh, this one has an add instruction. There is another, I'm not sure what this one is. Um, there is a subtract ESP and RSP return. So those are the gadgets. So this binary is very small, right? Because this is dynamically linked. At the wrong time, you were linked with uh, the same library. So if we check the static link one, so the static linked one, we have all the C libraries in this file as well. So as you can see, we have over 40,000 gadgets find in this um, battery. Obviously, we can also directly generate gadgets from the libraries. For the dynamic link one, we can do this to find out which C library is using. We can do LDD, and we can find, we find out this is a C library it is using. So we directly generate or generate gadgets from here. And so we have more than 20,000 gadgets. Some of them are jump gadgets, not for return ones. Uh, there are other tools you can use to uh, find those gadgets. Uh, some of the some of, some of the popular ones a lot of hackers use, one of them is the Pound tools, Python based, uh, also Rocker. Uh, uh, however, only only the Rob gadgets it can automatically generate something called a Rob chain. 
basically the share code to give you a shell. Uh, we will see that later. Um, but as long as you see the share coding generates, you realize it's actually very simple. Um, you can we can hand write those share code as well. Okay, so next I will explain how those tools, including Rob Gandhi, uh, find those gadgets. So basically, uh, we already discussed the, what linear disassembly is. The tool we use, um, most of the tools we use, like object thumb, to use a linear disassembly uh, in which the tool will decode all the byte se sequence, all the byte consecutively, and pass them into a list of instructions. For example, on the left hand side, we have the byte sequence 40, 31, 8, 0, whatever. If we do a linear disassembly starting from the beginning, this piece of binary byte bytes will be interpreted as uh, increase EAX, that is one byte, one instruction, then uh, XOR, EAX, two bytes, one instruction, then the last five bytes will be interpreted as move this number into EAX. Uh, however, there is a C3 for the value. This is a, this is basically value. This could be an address, could be an address, internal address. But if we interpret this byte sequence uh, from the middle instead of from the very beginning, what we can do is we can interpret it from here. Maybe this part will be garbage, or interpret it from here. So if we interpret it from here, AD itself will be interpreted as a lot of instruction, then C3 will be interpreted. As a return. So, in linear disassembly, what the disassembler tool does is start from the beginning, define the instruction, it moves forward, define another instruction, then you will see this part of the sheet, start uh, disassemble from this part, right? So, you generate three instructions. But in this kind of tool, which is trying to find the raw gadgets, you will always Interpret from here, then interpret from here. So every byte you will start with um, this symbol. And as long as you find a return, you can trace that to find some organic state. So that is how those tools work. So next, we are going to do our return to deep state attack on x64. With the help of uh, ROM. So, this is uh, the program we used in the first half of the semester to overflow the return address, return if say uh, in the 32 bit. Um, I put it here so you can recall what we were doing before. Uh, this program. We have a, a buffer from the disassembly. We can see the buffer size is 38 in hex, which is uh, 48 bytes. Then after that, we have the state EDP, another four bytes. Uh, on top of that, we have return address. So in 32 bit, what we do is we overwrite that return address in the leap state function system. Then eight bytes higher than that, we put the system functions argument, which is the string string SHS address. A higher four bytes higher than the return address on this part. We can put the exit function there, but uh, it's not required if the system if the system one is successful. So this one will never be executed. So in all of our work, Share uh, each point we have before, we just um, ignore this part. We don't really put the address in. But we can to make it uh, uh, more graceful. So, this is a 64 bit version of the same same code 
we can say the buffer size is the same 0.8 bytes on this instruction. Uh, however, the same EDP is not four bytes anymore, it's eight bytes. Even address is also eight bytes. Um, but those are not the reasons we cannot do return to leap failure. The reason we cannot do return to leap safe is um, the 64 bit. We do not pass arguments to call these using stack anymore. Uh, we use resistors. However, when we override the stack, there is no way we can override the registers. That's why we need to use this new technique. So this is a program we're going to have. Um, it's the same program as before. Only difference is not taking input from actually in. Instead, it's taking input from the local file for the export. So the disassembly and the stack looks like this. We have, so this is an F3. When we check the F3, we find that the buffer is at RBP minus four. So the buffer is only four bytes in this case. After the buffer, we have the same RBP eight bytes, that's 18 bytes. That's 12 bytes. So after that, we have the return address, another eight bytes. Then, then we have everything else on the set. So what we are going to do here is we are going to build something look like this. Okay. This this is probably uh, 20, 24 bytes. We are going to override those 24 bytes. And I'm going to explain to you why this works. So the first eight bytes, the return address, we're going to use the address of a gadget like this. The gadget is called RDI the return. Okay. So RDI is first of all. RDI is the value of the first argument. So the RDI should be the address of bin dot bin slash sh. So if we have the stack set up like this, when we execute the instruction return, um, stay with me here. We need to clearly, clearly understand what's going on here. When we Execute this return instruction. What happens is, uh, well, the first of all, the RSP in this case will point to here, which is the return address, original return address, right? Now we return this. So RSP will move up, move up eight bytes. And the value, which is this value, which we overwrite will be put into RIP. So RIP, so this is before. So after we execute this instruction, RIP will point to the instruction of RDI return. That's two instructions somewhere in the address space. This is what we find using that tool in that address space. Then RSP or points to eight bytes higher than the original written address. Then the next instruction to execute is pop RDI. So pop will read again from the same set. And right now RSP points to the address of the string. We can also get the address by just a searching. In that address space, this like the GDB technique we used before. So now, after pop RDI, what happens is the address of this string will be moved to RDI. And the ESP, the EIP, the EIP will move forward 
to point to the recurring assumption. Right? So EXP now points to here. EIP points to return. So the next instruction we're going to execute is return again. But it's not this return. It's somewhere in, in our address space, there's no return. So when we execute that return again, we're going to pop whatever is out there. A lot of A5. That's why we put the address of system here. So after that return instruction, we are going to return to the leap state system function with RDI has the, the value of that uh, string. So that basically predicts uh, this exploit. So the, the exploit will be very small. The key part is only 24 bytes, and there's another 12 bytes. The value we don't really care, right? So this is this is just garbage. Those zero bytes are garbage. Okay. So let's take a look how we can really explore this. So we only need three addresses here, right? So the first address we need the address of system. So we can do we can do a GDB on this one. We set a main breakpoint. Then we run this program. Then we print out where system is. Remember, this is 64 bits. So the this is actually eight bytes here. So let's start it here. So this is the address of system. We also need the address of uh, the string, right? So we just do a find bin message and we find one string in the say library. There could be more, but one is enough. String is this address. Then we need to find the gadget. Then we use the tool we just used. Are going to so we're using this one. So there are so many gadgets. Uh, we want to find the one with R D I. We want to find the one with R D I is a program, and uh, there is exactly the gadget we want. Uh, even if there is no gadget like this, we can combine other gadgets together to perform something equivalent. Okay, here you can see there's a gadget. Um, we copy this address. So this is a gadget address. Now go back to our slides to say, how should we construct the um, share code here? We have a so first of all. We need uh, 12 bytes of garbage. So we just do 12 bytes of garbage. Then after that, we have uh, eight bytes, eight bytes of the gadget address. We have that gadget address here. It's um, 63, 12. 14, then everything else is just a zero. Okay, then we have a letter. We can copy this one to make sense easier. A letter to eight bytes. Then we need the 
strings address. The strings address is here. This is very interesting. This is a trick you will use a lot later. You can use this trick to set uh, all the registers to arbitrary value you want. So the strings address is AA15 F6. Seven F is F seven? Is F seven? Okay. Then F F oh what is that? Are you sure? Oh it's F seven okay. It's F seven F F then another 7f, right? Then the address of the system is 0, 1, 0, f4, df, f7, ff, 7f, right? Okay. So now we output this to the exploit file. The, the program will read the exploit file. Then we can debug this program again to see if it works. Debug this program. Set a breakpoint in F6 also. Oh yeah, 64 bit. So we set a breakpoint directly out of all two. Execute the program. So we are in this is a lawful function. We are going to open that exploit. Then if it doesn't open exit, otherwise we will lose that. So we're set up a point here. We can trigger to go back to our share code, Rob share code. So we just uh, do an end here, keep working on this. So now we're calling. Okay, we skip the exit, that's good. So now we are reading from exploit. Now we are going to execute the return function, return instruction. Uh, and uh, now we already did the buffer overflow, we overflow the return address. So if we do SI here, we're supposed to return to our Rob gadgets. We are supposed to return to this instruction, okay? So when we do this, you see, we didn't return to the main function. Instead, we return to a library function called uh, E, and we are returning to um, the search in the middle of it, and we can find a pop ID address. But if we disassemble that function, you may find that so if we disassemble this function somewhere here, we can say we do not have that instruction. We do not have that sequence that the uh, pop RDI return down here. Right? This here because we jump into the middle of one of those instructions. That's why we get that gadget. So we're return to oops. Uh, let me actually do turn instruction set RP. Okay. So this is where we're at. Now we're going to do a pop RDI. When we will give that address into RDI. So, one more instruction here notice the value of RDI. We already did a pop. That was original pop marker, not a pop RDI. Because we jumped in the middle. Pop RDI. 
now we're already see the top RDI. That's why when the RDI. Oh, the top. You can see now the RDI, the very top, the second line. RDI right now point two. That's been better. That's exactly what we want. So now we have another return instruction here. Uh, I think what happens here is if it if address is six to two, if address is six to four, so the top sixteen is two five. But if we just only have the least of significance of five, so if we start from six to three, we will be top five yeah, I think. We can we can quickly verify that using this tool. Let's do a pop RDI. Oh, this is yeah. We need to see, see. pop RDI is one byte. That's five x pop R fifteen. Oh yeah, this pop R15 is only one five x. That's why if we jump in a little, we got to that uh, pop RDI either. So now we are going to do another return. So this return will return to the address of the system on the stack. And you can see after this return, it goes into the play library function system. Okay, so if we keep running from here, we're supposed to get a share, right? So if we just keep running, we just continue. Okay, unfortunately, we do not get a share. We get a segment call. Okay. So we successfully returned to the system function. We set up everything right. The only reason we get a system call is because let me let's debug this. Oh, it's actually here. No need to debug it. It's here. It's not this line of code. So this happens a lot when we do hacking. So when you so far it seems like we did everything right, but here it's not working. And when you encounter cases like this, what you need to do is just to figure out uh, why it's not working. The reason why it's not working is because of this instruction. When we run this instruction, we get a second report. So if you just Google this instruction, the first time I did this, I didn't know what happened here. Okay, everything's in track. I didn't know what happened. But from this instruction, you can see this use some features called the XMM. So it's related to uh, floating, floating computer, float point computer, computing units. Okay. Um, if you search this, just Google it. Just Google this, you can find a lot of discussions on why this instruction may trigger a signal. So basically what happens here is this instruction requires the stack to be aligned 16 bytes. We did everything right there, except we need when when we enter the system instruction, we send a system function, the stack has to be uh, 16 bytes aligned. However, what we have there is not 16 bytes aligned, it was eight bytes aligned. So it's very easy here. What we needed to do is we just need to and eight bytes uh, of uh, padding alignment on the stack. So to make sure this address is 16 bytes aligned. So what I will do here is this is kind of like adding a lock. This is kind of like what we we uh, we we add a lot of lock sled before, right? So this kind of lock step. A uh, lob sled is instruction. Here we're not adding instruction, we're ending the address of instruction. So what we're going to add is between system and the B message, we add the address of any return instruction here. So think about what this is. 
This doesn't really do anything, but just to give the control to the next door. Okay. For example, the return instruction, when, when the ESP port, the RSP point to here, and we have a return instruction, then we were, where are we going to return to? We're going to return to another return instruction, right? That another return instruction, then we're returning to the system. So this one is purely uh, handy. Just like, just like, um, uh, the lob in a lob state. So how do we get the address of return? I mean, that part is actually very easy. There are so many returns there. There are so many of those. So this one is clean. But any of those we can actually use, right? For example, this one, we have a pop RBC return. So we just need the last byte. So we drop. Okay. So our share our share code will look like we add another eight bytes here. Address is one A one zero four zero Okay, so this is our new exploit. We do the same thing, ball ball foo. We run this program. We keep running and here the return instruction. Okay, now we added the return instruction. Now this is our set. So first we're supposed to execute those two instructions. After that, we're supposed to return a lot of execute a lot of return instructions. Let's see if that is what happens. Okay, now we are in pop RDI return. One more instruction, one more. This is return. Okay, the return we return another return. Okay, right. and that return will pop um, the system address, the system function address. So this return we go to the system function address. However, this time the RSP has a different value. So RSP is the eight bytes. Higher than what we have before. And that eight bytes make it to, to uh, satisfy that requirement. So if we continue around here, you can see we get a zero. We don't get a second input. Yeah. Okay. So that gave us the share. Okay, so this is how we do return to DC at a 64 bit level. So we're going to take a five minutes break. Then when we come back, we will work on a more uh, complicated example.
Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Did you what happened here? Okay. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah. Something. Not really. Not sure what's going on in your case. Yeah, that's why. Box step by step, you figure out what. So the the tool we use here, uh, raw gadgets, um, it has a feature to give you back the uh, share code directly. You just need to give it uh, this amount. Um, I don't have any option. It will directly deal. Uh, share code um, for you. So this share code is not a, it's, it's just a return on share. It will make system calls to return on share. So if we do this on the 64 gig dynamically tool, remember this one only has uh, 67 bandwidth like that. But if we just do this, uh, it will tell us we cannot find enough bandwidth to build um, the share code for you. Okay. But it doesn't really mean you cannot do that. We just did it, right? But this tool cannot do that. Uh, but if we use a static version, uh, by the way, if we check the size of the static version and the so we're looking at those two files. You can do say 64, you can do say static. You can say the dynamic version, the size is uh, um, this one, 16K. Okay. The static one is um, 800K. Okay. Now, the static one also has the uh, same library functions, so it kind of sense. So, the tool couldn't generate a shared code. For this dynamic version, however, if we do this on the static one, um, the tool will try to figure out the share code, and uh, it actually it actually generates the share code. So at the beginning, it print out you have to find so many gadgets, then you try to generate the share code. So this is the share code. Well, this this is a Python. The Python, if you run the Python script, it will generate the share code, which is binary. Okay. So let's try to understand what this tool is generating here. We'll start with some easy ones first. Okay. There's a big chunk of this. It's just adding one for RAX. So, what is RAX? That's the system call number. So, it's basically setting up the system call number and um, the system call here should be 
uh, EXE is saving. So EXE is saving the uh, in SH. Uh, and this is a 64 bit version. So we're not going to use the 8 bit or the 64. And what we're using on the system call instruction. There is no instruction. His name is system call. Uh, and uh, everything else, there is a return. So this system call instruction is only the return, but in the system call, they will create a new process. They only return. So here, uh, I don't know how many of those are there. Uh, it should be the number of um, what, what is the system call number for? We're actually looking at the 64 bit version. What is the 64 bit? So, EXE is set to be. Okay, 64 bit version. EXE 70 is 59. Right? So, I here we can see this is a setting RAX of zero and after the rx parent we are just n blocks. Okay. So I believe there should be 50. So how do we do this? How do we count this? Rep and RAX one then we do a word count. Here there are also some um okay, so we should do this. Um, okay, 59. Okay, we have been granted exactly 59 of those. So that is the system for our um exe CV. Then before that, uh we have this. I'll actually make some slides about this. So before that, uh, we have this. The thing. So the first instruction is called ISI return. Then the second one, the second eight bytes, is not an instruction. And this is uh, an address of some banner. And that banner. So basically, we're moving that scanner's address to ISI, and that scanner will be will be a string of bit zero. Let's move forward first. Well, we have a call RAX. Well, RAX will have the in of H. Let's take a look at this. The system calls. RSI, which one is RSI? RSI is uh, the second argument. So RSI has the, uh, oh, the RS has the argument. So the first one is filing, the second one is argv. So this one you can just give zero. Environment, you can also give zero. So, the data we have here probably just points to a zero, eight bytes of zeros. Then, then we have uh, RAX, and that has to point to the string. That's why we have the string and this. No, we actually have the string. Not the string address here. So we talk. So 
We set Rax as zero. This one we set Rx as zero. Then we move that zero to eight bytes after, basically right after that string. So we make that string ending with zero. This is what this instruction, those several instructions done. Now after that, we do a pop RSI again. And this one points to data plus eight. So you have zero. So this is really the setting of RSI to zero. So in this case, RSI is uh, the environment variable from this one, concrete to zero. Then we pop RDX also zero, and that is the environment variable. Then after that, RDI, RDI we already set. RDI now points to that screen. Right? So after that, we just uh, do set up the R A X, set up the system parameter, and then eventually, then eventually we do the system call. So this one has only one system call. There is no exit here. If this one is error, then we are not doing this for it. We just crash. Okay. But this is a this is a vanity share code. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, this this part is pretty difficult to follow. Not only at the assembly level, at the same level also. Yeah, but A C level is compiled by that code. Yeah. Yes. There's no way to do that. Exactly. Here you have to do it by yourself. Good question. So next. Um, next I will introduce you to something. Some useful gadgets uh, you may find um, we need uh, in future classes, especially next class. Next class, we're going to see a much more complicated challenge, which will use one of those uh, tricks. So, first of all, you can just uh, simply sit down on the stack. Um, 
So you don't care about the value of R yet. So basically, speaking items on the set. Uh, what we do just now is similar to this to that uh, block. Also, if you want to store some values in your research and see what I'm saying, um, those are also some values you can do. Uh, also, if you want to go log, you can just go to And sometimes you can find a log data. So this is not done really bad. So if you cannot find a system point instruction, then you can just do a written to save in that case. Uh, a very interesting gadget we will use next week. Uh, I, I designed a challenge uh, specifically that you have to use this trick to solve next class. And uh, in that challenge, you have to visit the stack. So the original stack was not good enough for you to use. So you have to use a gadget to point the stack to somewhere you can control. And there's a gadget, and there's, there's a instruction for exchange in MKA6. This one can exchange RAX and RSP, right? So basically it's set RSP, right? So then you can set the value of RAX somehow, then you put the value of RSP. To RSP, so it gives it uh, not set. That's a very useful thing. Um, also, the example we just saw there this one. So, this one, we're, doing, we're trying to set fifty six to RAX. If you use 50, 59 um, instructions to do that, oh, no, instructions. I would say 59 items on the stack to do that. Um, but actually, you don't need to. What you can do is the trick. Or you can just do a, you can just do a pop, pop RAX return. So you put the value of RAX on the stack. Same as what we did here. Here we're trying to set the value of RPI, right? So we put the value we want to set on the set. So this is a string address. Let's say if we want to set RAX, like what we want to do there, then we just find a gadget called RAX return. So here we just set it down. That'll be the same, right? It will be much cleaner shared. Well, the problem is sometimes you cannot find those gadgets. You cannot find a pulp. Uh, RAX um, in your record. Well, but uh, I think the one um, rarely appears is a pop ECX. Um, I think uh, many programs don't have the pop ECX gadgets uh, or RCX gadgets. Other gadgets, you know, easier to find. So what we're going to do uh, next is I will give you maybe uh, more than one hour to work on this one to show you how far we can go. Uh, then we will talk about how to do this. Uh, we are going to, uh, each of you, we are going to uh, write a long share code. Uh, this share code, is I'm not going to return a share. Instead, we are going to read a secret file um, this is the name of the file, secret. So open it, then you have, then you turn it off. So basically, you are going to make two system ports, like what we did before, exactly like what we did before. So you could be written, uh, open system call, a certain file system port. Like with this one, you are not going to directly write the share code itself. You are going to use log, find the gadgets. To set up those registers to make it happen. Okay. So the target program will be that return to leave say 64 bit dynamically. Um, this is dynamically. The gadget in the executable to be 
number is small, only 69 there, it's 67. So you can also look for gadget in the same library. Um, also, it's better if you just use a template uh, like this, then you are justified changing those edits. Okay. You are looking for gadget and changing those edits to make it new. Make sure you have a challenge for them. You can uh, you can comment there what is the instruction and you are trying to get it or what is the data you want to set to. Okay, so let's do this together. Now I'm going to share the virus with you on GitHub. No, not GitHub, Slack. Then we can start working on this. Uh, one hour later, let's see how far we can get. Just to some view all the files you need there. Oh, the site is already on my website. Yeah, because yeah, you just have to use several commands there. Maybe. Just the soul. 
should already have all of us in the room today, or in the screen, you want to go to the screen, or that's going to fire and all this. Maybe you can put this in the middle of the screen. Yeah, okay, we have all If you don't use virtual machine, you need to follow the instructions on my screen. You need to attend some page.
this is what I will plus the URA with. Uh, but when I look at this, I will actually not making system as ultimately ultimately function for the same. The first function for it ultimately the second function for the same. So so this part doesn't really matter you can replace this one with system call as well. It should also work. Uh, so do you want to use system call? No, it's okay. System call, do you want a system call or function call? You already found it, right? It's almost the same. For example, um, let's take a look at this. So, first of all, I'm going to open that file, right? So, here I choose to do the function call. So, this, so this is a function, 1264's address. Then I write again, uh, like the template, but then we set up the string, take it to the and to the Alpha section. So the first of all, I guess, the first one of all, I guess, was to set up that. So after that, just trying to set RSI to zero, then make that function call. Okay. So after making a function call, R E A uh, no, R A X should have the return value, which is a R D figure. So that's why I was looking for some gadget that has R. Yes, and I only find this very long gander. Okay, can do this very long gander. The only thing I need actually here RSI and move RAX to RSI. Everything after that, I don't really need that, but it is there. So I only need to make sure those do not crash the program. So this one will not crash the program. You will move ECX, you will change ECX value. I don't care about the X value. This one, you will be quickly um, over from down from answer as I try that. So this one, if I'm not careful, may crash the program. That's why I set up the ISI and RPI there to make sure this part doesn't crash the program. But what I really need is this part. Okay. I do not find a better candidate to do this, so we won't have to go through all the things here. Then, after that, just to make another system called single file. So, this one is much easier to decide. So, let me take it, go through that. So, this one is just a, the exit, exit system call. You don't have to use this. If everything above works fine, then you don't need this part. This is just a, a one example. Uh, so many tricks you can do to make it work. Okay, just give you some ideas. Keep working on it. I'm not showing you that anymore. <laughs>
Oh, here I mean, here, maybe it's already zero. It is already zero here. Maybe in memory. Maybe I check. Last year, maybe I check in memory.
So we're almost done here. Um, so this one is quite tricky for us. So we are working, we are working, working on it for uh, two weeks. This is one of the weeks for two weeks on uh, our homework. This was homework we were able to complete on this. So next week, uh, we are going to finish it. How many classes we have left?
Oh yeah, we only have a three class next because we're going to have a, a final uh, on December 6th. It will be the same format as the intern. Uh, several uh, open book questions to just to give you some free points. Then will be several um, CTF challenges. Uh, I, will, I will make make them doable in two hours. Um, some of them could be, I, I feel format screen could be really, really, really tricky. Rob can be really, really tricky. So if I put a format screen or Rob here, I will do some things to make sure it's doable in two hours. Yeah, there's nothing on final breaking. I, I want to get everything out of the way in the last week. So. Oh, there, there may be a homework in the final week. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, see you guys next week.